This is a podcast on capnography. It must be understood that this 15 or 20 minute podcast will do nothing to compare with more extensive books that have been written on the subject. Um, this was probably the first major book on capnography, several hundred pages long. There's a more recent edition that's probably about three years old now. I have it on very good authority that there's an excellent chapter in that book on the use of modified nasal cannula for monitoring capnography or for performing capnography, monitoring antidotal CO2 during conscious sedation. There are two basic types of capnometry sampling devices, side stream devices or ty types of capnometers, side stream capnometers and mainstream capnometers. We really only use side stream capnometers, so the majority of you have probably never seen a mainstream capnometer. The device itself is a piece of metal that measures a couple of inches long, and it goes between the elbow on the circuit and the, the Y connector that comes in on the other side. The problem with the device is that it's extremely heavy, so it tends to pull out the endotracheal tube with the weight of the device itself it's, if it's hanging there. Also, it's non-disposable. Each device is fairly expensive, and things being what they are, it's not uncommon that the device gets thrown away, therefore making it very expensive. It does have a couple of advantages, though. This figure looks at the tracings of a mainstream capnometer and a side stream capnometer. You'll notice that the bottom trace looks at airway pressure, so you see as the airway pressure goes up here, that's the start of inspiration. All right, so what do you see? Well, when you look at them and compare, you'll see that when inspiration starts with a mainstream capnometer, you get the immediate loss of CO2, which makes sense because as inspiration starts with a positive pressure breath, then the gas that's flowing past the mainstream capnometer is going to be devoid, hopefully devoid, of CO2. There is a time lag, however, with the side stream capnometer. And you know that because you know you intubate the patient, and when you've struggled to intubate the patient, you're not sure whether the tube's in the trachea or the esophagus. It sometimes feels like it takes forever for the CO2 waveform to appear on the screen. Side stream capnometers have their own problems associated with them. One of them that's more interesting is related to the presence of the water trap. So what happens is that you'll see at um, in part A, figure A, or part A of this figure, what you see is that during inspiration, the system's pressurized, and so what happens is that there is an area up above the, the compressed gas that's devoid of CO2. There is gas compressed below that, and that contains CO2 as indicated by the gray area, the gray shading. When the, the um, pressure is released, then the compressed gas comes back up and enters into the sampling tubing or the CO2 sensor, and the end result may be some kind of a change in the, the um, or artifact in the value reported by the capnometer. So what does capnometry tell you? Well, it tells you something about CO2 production, venous return, cardiac output, and ventilation of the lungs. The normal capnogram is described as having four parts. Inspiration, which coincides with an entitled or a CO2 of zero. Early expiration, the alveolar gas portion, and then the onset of inspiration again. People who write about these things say that there are seven portions, actually eight or nine, we'll see in the next slide, that need to be evaluated when you look at um, the 
CO2 wave. One of the things that's most interesting that people talk about is the angles at the corners, if you will, of the CO2 waveform. The alpha angle, the first one, is supposed to be a reflection or, or be abnormal in the presence of airway obstruction, and it's supposed to reflect capnometer response time, whereas the beta angle represents free breathing. We'll actually see that in some abnormal CO2 waves as we look at those. There's also a potential problem with the sampling because if you look in figure A, what you really have is a clean sample of gas in the capillary tubing or the sampling tubing and it produces a clean wave. As the sampling goes on though, or, or, or because it's not perfect, you get some contamination at each end of the, the sampling CO2 bolus, not sampling bolus, but the bolus of CO2 that's in the line. And so you get some attenuation of the sharp angles of the capnogram. The worse that gets, the more attenuated the waves become. And then potentially it may not even get back down to zero if there's continuous mixing in there. And we'll talk about circumstances, at least one circumstance in which that may happen. So why is there normally a difference between arterial and end tidal CO2? And why does the difference increase in the OR? So the difference between arterial and end tidal CO2 is due to the normal VD to VT dead space to tidal volume ratio. Normally that the alveolar dead space is almost unmeasurable, so the value of the arterial CO2 and entile CO2, those values are very close. When you put the patient on positive pressure ventilation, you get an increase in that VD to VT, or the amount of dead space. And we'll talk about that as a reflection of West's um, zones of the lung in a few minutes. A lot of people think that it's due to the endotracheal tube. We'll talk about why that's not right. We'll talk about why alveolar uh, problems occur as well. And then there are some pathologic problems that cause an increase in the arterial to end tidal CO2 difference also. So whenever you're asked why is there an increase in the arterial to end tidal CO2 difference? There's only one answer to that question. The answer is always an increase in dead space. Dead space is that part of the inspiration which did not penetrate to those regions of the lung in which gas exchange occurred, and therefore that gas is exhaled unchanged. There are several components of dead space. Anatomic dead space, alveolar dead space, physiologic dead space, and apparatus dead space. We're going to talk about alveolar dead space first. That's part, the part of the inspired gas that passes through the anatomic dead space. The anatomic dead space is basically the trachea and conducting passages to mix with gas at the alveolar level, but it doesn't participate in gas exchange. It's due to inadequate perfusion. We usually talk about dead space as being complete absence of perfusion in the presence of ventilation, but there can also be relative dead space. That is, the perfusion is low in the presence of ventilation. Again, as I said earlier, normally alveolar dead space is too small to be measured with any confidence. A decrease in cardiac output, regardless of the cause, results in pulmonary hypotension, which will uh, produce a decrease in the perfusion of the uppermost areas of the lung. So if you look at West's lung zones, and you remember that zone one of the lung is where pulmonary artery pressure is greater than 
sorry, where alveolar pressure is greater than pulmonary artery pressure, which is greater than venous pressure. And zone two is where pulmonary artery pressure is greater than alveolar pressure, which is greater than pulmonary venous pressure. And we talked about this element right here basically being a Starling resistor. So when you use positive pressure ventilation, two things happen. One thing that occurs is that there's an increase in the alveolar pressure. Normally, when you take a spontaneous breath, you generate a negative intrathoracic pressure. So alveolar pressure actually decreases during inspiration with a positive pressure breath because you're forcing gas into the lungs. Alveolar pressure increases during inspiration. At the same time, there's also a decrease in the transmural pulmonary artery pressure. That happens because a positive pressure breath impedes venous return to the heart, while a spontaneous breath augments venous return to the heart. So if you've got a situation where the pulmonary artery pressure is greater than the alveolar pressure, and you decrease alveolar pressure, sorry, increase alveolar pressure and decrease pulmonary artery pressure, you're going to have the relationship of those two changed such that alveolar pressure will be greater than pulmonary artery pressure, which is by definition zone one of the lung. This is a schematic of ventilation perfusion ratios. The dots down here are supposed to represent oxygen added to the blood. So in the normal unit, blood flows in left to right. Oxygen gets added from the alveolus into the pulmonary capillary. In absolute shunt, there's no ventilation into this lung unit, and the blood flow goes by, and the PO2 after it's passed the, the lung unit is the same as it was before. In relative shunt, there's a decrease in ventilation relative to perfusion, and so there's less oxygen that's added to the blood. And that, the VQ ratio there, is greater than zero but less than one. What really, we're really talking about, though, primarily is dead space. That's when there's no perfusion but continued ventilation. The classic example of that would be a pulmonary embolism. Other factors other than a pulmonary thromboembolism would be a venous air embolism, an amniotic fluid embolism, a fat embolism, anything you can think of that would cause that. Anatomic dead space. We already talked about that peripherally. That's basically the trachea and the main stem bronchi and conducting airways down to the place where gas exchange can occur. Airway devices can produce, uh, can alter anatomic dead space. The normal extrathoracic dead space is about 70 milliliters, but with an endotracheal tube or an LMA, the dead space is usually about 35 milliliters. This is interesting because most people will say as an explanation for why this occurs, that there's an increase in dead space as a result of the endotracheal tube or the LMA, when in fact the dead space is decreased. Bronchodilators can also cause an increase in dead space. This is another look at the pressure relationships that occur in, sorry, the pressure relationships that occur in the different lung zones, whether the patient's upright or supine. Again, the same basic thing that we talked about. You'll notice, though, that when the patient's upright, there actually is some zone one of the lung. But when the patient's supine, because the height difference between the heart and the apex of the lung is greater than it is between the heart and the highest portion of the lung here, the zone one of the lung tends to disappear when the patient is supine, or at least be reduced. So let's look at some abnormal CO2 waveforms. This is called a breathlet or a curare cleft. You'll see that there's a 
depression in the plateau that's occur that occurs as a result of the patient attempting to take a spontaneous breath during exhalation. It's generally associated not so much with inadequate muscle relaxation, although you can clearly make it go away by paralyzing the patient, but rather to some degree by an increase in CO2 because the patient wouldn't be making a respiratory effort if the CO2 were not above the apneic threshold. Cardiogenic oscillations are fairly straightforward. They're regular bumps, if you will, in the EKG or in the capnogram that coincide with um, QRS complexes on the EKG, or at least with the heart rate. Exhausted CO2 absorbent. What do you see if your CO2 absorbent becomes exhausted? You'll see that the baseline is increased. While you're waiting for the CO2 absorbent to be replaced, you can alleviate, if not completely eliminate the problem by increasing the fresh gas flow rate. Note that that's what they did there. Effectively, you make the system a non-rebreathing system by doing that, and then the CO2 absorber becomes irrelevant. A sampling line leak causes a classic steeple sign. Esophageal intubation may be associated with initial low value of end tidal CO2, which decreases progressively over several breaths. Here's a capnogram from a patient with COPD. Notice that the angle here, what was described as the alpha angle in one of the earlier slides, is more, it, it's not as sharp, it's more obscured. So if you look at that, you'll see that in terms of a change in the alpha angle between normal and a patient with COPD. Remember we talked about the beta angle as being a, an indicator of CO2 rebreathing? You see that here at this point because this angle, again, is not as sharp as it was over here normally. Okay, This is a little bit more difficult to see than most of the other things, but you'll notice that the CO2, that the, that the downslope is more blurred as well as having a change in that angle. The incompetent expiratory valve is pretty straightforward. You get CO2 rebreathing in that. What about endobronchial intubation? Well, there was a study that looked at accidental endobronchial intubation, and what they showed was that they really, out of 154 patients, they didn't record what happened in 115 of them. So you're really talking about only 39 patients. So, and of those 39 patients, what they showed was that in 23 of them, basically two-thirds of them, this entitled tidal CO2 was normal. There probably wasn't any difference in the numbers of patients or the statistical significance of whether end tidal CO2 was increased or decreased with an endobronchial intubation. Tachypnea presents a problem. Uh, this is mostly a problem in pediatric patients. If the, the patient is breathing very quickly, if the respiratory rate is very rapid, the CO2 waveform doesn't have an opportunity to get back down to baseline, and it starts to look as though the patient's rebreathing. In reality, however, the other, there's also a problem at the peak the end tidal, because this waveform hasn't actually reached a plateau. It may not give meaningful end tidal CO2 values for any gas exhaled by the patient. So you shouldn't just look at the, the bottom line out of all these waveforms, is that you shouldn't just look at the numbers, the digital value of the end tidal CO2. You really ought to look at the waveform in order to try to establish a diagnosis. That's the end of the podcast on capnography. Thank you very much.